thank everybody for allowing me to speak here. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak here. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak here. So, I want to talk today a little bit about the changes we're seeing to the space sector and the space economy. But first, I want to use myself as a case study to show the changes that have happened just in the last 15 years or so. So I'm from New Jersey, what I said, what she's listening to. And growing up, um, I like almost everybody else, I love space. You know, space and dinosaurs. Kai Kong, Kong Long, those young, Fei Tong Hong. But like many other people, I didn't really see space as a real opportunity for my career. And there are a couple of reasons for that. You know, number one, who goes to space? No one. It's something that you observe, it's not something you take part in. That was my thought process as a child. But when I got to high school, it became time for me to pick a language to study. So I went to my mom and I go, you know, should I learn French? Should I learn Chinese? Should I learn Latin? And she goes, Chinese food is delicious, you should learn Chinese. And it was that simple. So that's the real reason I started learning Chinese. Anyway, it kind of went on like that for a few years, and I got to college. I went to Hamilton College in upstate New York, and I was lucky enough to have met Jin Laoshir, and she was one of the foremost Chinese educators in the United States. And when I arrived, she basically said, here's what's going to happen. You've studied for four years, you're going to go on. You're going to go to China, you're going to learn more about Chinese culture, and you're going to be fantastic. And I was very lucky to have met her. Um, during my time at Hamilton, I also applied, almost as a joke, to be an intern at NASA Ames Research Center in California. Because, you know, again, who gets that job? Who works at NASA? And that was still my thought process. But I got it. 我在上大学的时候，我申请到一个在 NASA 的实习，在他们的国际关系部。在这个情况下，我学好一些在航天方面他们怎么做的国际关系。我觉得我发现真的，一者非常有意思，二者我自己真的可以参加。I found that I could actually take part in those in those activities in space, and it was really the first time that became a possibility. So then I came and I studied in China. And I was here and I drove my professors crazy because in their mind, and in many people's minds, I was supposed to attend class and then go directly to study in my room. Every day you want to study more than 100 characters. Um, and it was tough, but I didn't do that. Instead, I went to a coffee bar. Or to a work. So instead of going to study in my room after class, I would go to a coffee shop and meet normal Chinese people and I would talk to them normally in order to actually understand normal Chinese culture. And I find that that was very helpful. <laughs> um, because although I might not know some of the most, most, most formal Chinese characters, I do have a thick Beijing accent. So after graduating, I decided to go back to China, and I had the opportunity to work at Google. After having worked at NASA Ames, where they have many partnerships with Google, I kind of saw the difference in culture between the two, between the Google that you see in the United States and just the culture of Google that you find in China. Um, and afterwards, I worked in the technology sector for a while, and here's some of the main differences, some of the most important things that I learned. In fact, one of the first things I ever learned in my first Chinese class in college was the word guanxi. It means relationship. And it is one of the most important things when doing business or just living in China. And in the United States, actually, but for different reasons. In China, it's all about who you know. You know, it's very difficult to succeed in the industry unless you know the right people. Especially if you're a foreigner. If so, in order to actually enter the Chinese market, you really need to be, you really need to have those relationships. 
in New Jersey, you know, we say, you know, I know a guy. And in the United States, the way it generally works is relationships are incredibly important as well. But those relationships are formed basically this company, this person, they did, they performed a service and it was good. And so I trust them. Why change it if it's good, right? Um, so that's where it kind of starts. Now, I also had experience learning about the importance of localization. So you kind of have the basic localization of translation. But you also need to understand that just because you translate your product into another language doesn't necessarily mean it is ready to enter the market and succeed. But there's also more than that. It, it, there, there's, there's, there's the cultural side of it. There's whether or not the product's actually, you know, going to be received well by them. And that has something to, that has something to do with your philosophy, it has to do with the relationships, it has to do with the color of your logo, the phrasing that you use. Um, and so I was working in the technology sector and I decided I'm going to go back to space because I love space. So, you know, I joined the dark side. I went over to, I went over to the space sector. And I found that it was different. Whereas in the technology sector, you can pretty much enter the other market. There are, of course, some import export controls. There are some issues that you'll have to go through. But generally speaking, you can do it. Space is a little bit different. Space, it, has, it carries along with it very high risk. So every time you're doing something, there's very high risk. But also, at this time, you know, 10 years ago, it's almost all government control. So if you really want to enter the market, you basically need to work with the government. You know, you add on top of that, you have ITAR restrictions, the import-export policies of the United States, and you basically have created a culture that makes it almost impossible for a private company to survive, you basically created this wall. So it was a little bit different because now you have these gigantic players who have been working in the industry for decades, who have these close relationships with the government, so you've got the glossy there. But it's so difficult for these new companies to join the fray. So for ITAR, if, if you're not familiar with it, it basically controls what you can import and export within between the United States. And in fact, China is specifically mentioned as some of the focus, the focal points of it. So things like satellites, rockets, spacecraft systems, potential military end-use technology, and associated technology. So it's a little bit vague and also associated knowledge. It's not even just a matter of hardware, it's also the information that you bring with you, which creates also a vague map. So it is a very important thing It became a maze of how you're actually going to navigate this system. And as a result, it became almost taboo for commercial companies to enter the market. But then, of course, whenever there's somebody wants to me, whenever you have something difficult or something annoying, it's also an opportunity to expand. You know, if you're trying to come up with a new idea for a company or a product, ask yourself, what was the last thing that really annoyed you? Because if it annoys you, it annoys other people, and people will, you know, pay for it. Um, and just because something is difficult doesn't mean it's not worth it. It's not worth doing. I mean, our entire the United States, the entire program of space started because we want to do the hard things. We want to do it because it's hard, because it's worth doing. So whether you want to look at it from an inspirational point of view, from you know President Kennedy, or you want to look at it from Henry Kaiser, the creator of Kaiser Permanente Hospitals, as a more profitable angle. It's worth doing. So, you've got all these companies that have been created over the last 20, 30 years that have been surviving and working with the government closely. And they basically said, hey, government, I can do what you're doing. I can do it cheaper, and you should pay me to do it. And they succeeded. And this has been a huge boon to the generation of new technologies and opportunities for those companies. But generally speaking, they're basically saying, government, you're doing this, I can do it too. And 
that makes it a little bit easier because you can see where the, where the, the model is coming from. Now, many of these companies are also those innovators. They are pushing the limits, you know, more so than many other sectors you'll see. But at the end of the day, many of them are still seeing those restrictions on import, export, and cooperation as too strong or too difficult to manage. But something interesting is happening. We're doing more difficult things. We're doing things that can't be done by one country, that it, let alone one company. So we're in this kind of interesting situation where we have the existing industry that is still doing what it's always been doing, but we're faced with the new situation and the fact that, we're, that we need to work together, both on government missions as well as private industry. But we're also seeing something else. With the development of new industry with regards to uh, space technology, you're starting to see it become normalized. When I was a kid, nobody goes to space because space was astronauts. Now, you have companies that are sending up mini sats, nano sats, cube sats. You have kids in, in high school building satellites that are going into space. It's something that people can actually get their, wrap their minds around and actually understand, which is creating kind of a new global culture that, that, that's completely new, and it's very interesting. But on the other hand, while many of those com companies saw the, like, the regulations as too, too strong and unavoidable. Others have started to see it as an opportunity. Like I said, every time there's a difficult situation, it's also an opportunity to succeed and accomplish something, and in many of these companies' cases, profit. So what these companies are starting to see is, and they've already emerged, is that as private companies, they also want access to this global market. So. They're starting to look to work together with other countries and other organizations to succeed. It's also a cultural shift. As younger people get involved, governments have also recognized the need to have this international cooperation. One example of this is the United Nations recently began a smaller group called SGAC. And this group is geared towards young professionals getting them involved in space. The United Nations basically turned and said, how can we help young professionals feel like they're actually part of the industry because at this time, the industry is made up of you know, older players, people who've been around for decades, and you have all these brilliant young minds, and we're trying to get them acclimated, and trying to get them actually to take part. So how do you do it? You kind of create this new space generation. I've heard the word spaces thrown around over the last couple of months especially, and it's the idea that being in space, in the space sector, makes you different. It's a special thing, and I agree. You know, in, a, in, in, in you know, when we, when we landed on the moon, it was an amazing thing, and it was almost detached from the rest of humanity. And in a way, it physically was, of course, but I digress. But the idea of being a spacist, while great, while it's great to imagine that we're different, that people who work in space are special, it's starting to not only go away, but also almost hurt our, hurt the, hurt our ability to, to, to move forward, as the need to normalize it is more important and get everybody involved. So SGAC, the Space Generation Advisory Council, was started in 1999, and originally there were 160 students and young professionals who were invited to join. Since then it's grown much larger, and there are representatives from, from over 100 different nations who all take part in projects. And it's not just a matter of creating reports and talking to the, to the UN about you know, how young professionals get involved, it's an opportunity for young professionals to actually understand that space, in a way, is a global industry. And we're creating a global network of these professionals, and it's an opportunity that people haven't had in the past. So it grew from the original 160 members to over 4,000 members. Um, and in fact, just next month, there's going to be our next Asia Pacific conference. And it's an opportunity to introduce young professionals and also expand the reach of young professionals to really globalize the space sector and change the mindset from, I'm from this country. You might be a representative of that country, but you're also joining the global space industry. 
But on the other hand, you're starting to see, like I said, there are all of these regulations and difficulties that are in the way, but the global industry is also seen as a profitable opportunity for many different country, companies. So in fact, because there are those barriers to entry, because there's that maze, you start to see different companies all over the world, in every country, starting to emerge and say, hey, maybe you as a government can't work with this other country, or maybe you won't, or maybe this existing company isn't willing to take that risk. You know, go against the taboo, go against the grain, but we will. Whether it's a government that is more geared towards a government-controlled space sector, and you have a company that is emerging as the first commercial entity, or you have a company in a country that has hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of space companies saying, hey, there's that really large developing country over there, I need to work with them, but there might be regulations. Saying, let's see how we can navigate it. And something, and something else interesting is happening. Regulations are changing. Governments want to enable their companies to succeed. By finding those holes in the wall of regulation, you have these companies forcing policymakers to reconsider their, 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 their previous ideas and their ideals on how the space industry should be controlled and led. And so, while it might be very difficult to directly have countries and governments interact with each other due to already existing taboos, political schemes, uh, differing ideologies, what we've seen recently is we're able to expand and improve cooperation, government cooperation, and commercial cooperation through that commercial trade. In addition, just like it was important to have Wansi when you come into, the, to come into China or when in the United States, you know your few people that you go to, those networks are starting to get broken down. So you see companies like Sasser is creating, is saying, maybe they don't even know what else is out there. So saying, you understand your country. I know you understand your own country. That's fantastic. You understand your, your own economy. So by giving them the opportunity to understand the other choices, the other options, you're able to take hold of this new globalized world to improve and have new opportunities and success. So you also have these large companies that are, it's just really a question of how are we going to push those limits? Is it going to be through AI? Maybe. Is it going to be through space, space travel? These are basically holes in the wall of government saying, I don't really know how I'm going to handle this when it happens. Good luck and we'll figure it out as we go. And that's really the case that we're running into now. So will we, will we have a space-born country? Recently we had Asgardia created as, as an idea. There were tens of thousands of people signing up just to try and say, yeah, I would take part in that. That would be, that'd be great. I would love to take part in a space-born country. So it's actually to the point where people are no longer saying, I represent my own country and I want to enter this other economy. We're actually at the point where people are saying, everything's become globalized. And it's only through this kind of cultural understanding, economic understanding, and increased cooperation and, 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 and discussion and communication that we can actually get to that point. So the next generation might have an incredibly different viewpoint than I or you. But the trends that we're seeing now are pointing towards a world where it's just globalized. Your first thought isn't, that's another country but rather the cultures have mixed to the point where they're more and more similar, especially with regard to business. Thank you.